so much a memorial, not so much a service, but a chance to remember our friend, and as Carol asked us, to emphasize the funny, the happy. And so, in a few minutes, I'm going to hand this over to some people who can do that. Um, I knew Gary only about 16 years, which, as I've been informed, makes me barely an acquaintance. <laughs> a recent happenstance. Move out of my way, get me to my friends. Uh, there are people here who know him a lot better and a lot longer, and those are the people we definitely want. So I guess the plan is to give at least four or five of, of Gary's closest um, friends a chance to briefly talk about what they remember, particularly the funny and the happy. Um, before doing so, I do want to at least acknowledge a couple of people. Uh, there's too many to acknowledge who come from a long distance, but Carol asked me uh, to at least acknowledge just a few people who um, played a very special role for Gary and came a long way. Martha McCoy, where is Martha? Uh, thank you for coming, Martha. We will get to it. We'll, uh, we'll, it's probably going to be a lot of clap. Uh, Martha worked uh, towards her PhD in the political science program with Gary. Uh, she became executive director of Executive Democracy in the 1990s, which is a national organization that helps communities solve local problems through public dialogue. She's won numerous awards for that. She served on White House task forces, and she and Gary and Carol, needless to say, have been friends for 25 years, which, for Gary, that's a medium amount of time. That's not bad. <laughs> 25 years, I guess that's okay. Uh, but thank you for coming. Um, congressman Rob Simmons, to my left, uh, con uh, Connecticut's congressman from 2001 to 2007. He actually began here working towards a uh, PhD in the political science program with Gary. He served in the U.S. Army in Vietnam, earned two bronze stars, and was the state's first business advocate. He is chair of the Yankee Institute for Public Policy, director of Combat Veterans for Congress, and in many other capacities has served the public for 40 years. And for that service, he's earned numerous awards. Uh, since meeting Rob during the UConn graduate student days of Rob Simmons, Gary and Carol have always been close and admired Rob, and I know they, it would mean a lot uh, that Rob Simmons is here today. Uh, let me stop at that point. There's just probably too many people um, uh, to walk through. And uh, what I want to do is uh, introduce just a few of his closest friends, the ones who knew him the closest and the longest, and that's hard to imagine because we all uh, have our special stories, and we want to give them a chance to share some reminiscences, and then uh, w without turning this into a thing where everybody is stuck listening to people for a long time, uh, allow us to uh, break up at some point and allow us to share amongst ourselves. So let me start with uh, uh, Larry Bowman, if Larry could uh, come up here. And Larry is without a microphone, so I warn you of that. <laughs> my, my son Cassidy has said several times, Project, Dad, project. <clears throat> it's really nice to see so many old friends. I'm just sorry about the circumstances that brought us together today. This is a tribute to Gary Clifford. <clears throat> Nearly 45 years ago, in the fall of 1969, Gary Clifford and I arrived at UConn together. We shared an office that first year, and we were close friends ever since. We shared life experiences, departmental challenges, the history and politics of our time, a passion for sports, and much, much more. This afternoon at this timely but very sad event, I want to share a few stories with you. The stories are going to come in several categories. <clears throat> is this, can you hear? Yes. yes. The first category is, you can talk to a slice, but a hook won't listen. <laughs> Gary and I loved to play golf. Gary had a wonderful memory about everything, far better than my own, and could always remember our good and our, good and our bad shots across several decades. <laughs> to, to say that Gary's swing was unorthodox is to give it all benefit of a doubt. <laughs> when he stood at the golf ball, he was very hunched over. He used a baseball grip. And at the club where we played for many years, he had the nickname Captain Hook because of the very, the very exaggerated right-to-left flight of his golf ball. Um, Gary was a very good golfer, however, and uh, you've seen on this picture here, uh, he, his team in high school won a state championship, and there's a picture of him being enshrined in the Melrose High Hall of Fame. <laughs> then there is the matter of driving. Not of a golf ball, but of an automobile. <laughs> Gary and Carol always drove big old Lincolns. 
Carol thought they were the safest car on the road, and that was enough for Gary. Rich Eskis, Gary, and I, many years ago, went to Tallwood Golf Club in Hebron to play a round of golf together. I don't exactly remember the circumstances, but Gary and Rich came together, and I came by myself. So we played our round in the morning. We were having lunch, and the question came up about who Rich was going to go back to campus with. And Rich said something like, I have to get back to campus for din by dinner, so I better go with Larry. <laughs> which, which alluded to Gary's well-known and well-deserved propensity for driving slowly. <laughs> and safely, but definitely slowly. So that was settled. Uh, Gary left the, left the parking lot right before us. Rich and I followed. We came over the first hill right out of the country club, and Gary was pulled over for, sweep, for speeding. <laughs> Certainly, certainly the only speeding ticket of his life, and uh, a, a good lesson in life not being fair. For more than two decades, um, Gary, Rich Hiscus, I, and my brother-in-law, Stephen, uh, played an annual golf tournament, the Truro Invitational, in Cape Cod. Gary and Stephen were always the best golfers, and they usually won, but that was hardly the point. It was really just to have a good time. And every, every year in every tournament had a special feature, was to have a tournament <coughs> dinner um, in which Gary, the only New Englander among us, reveled in teaching all us Midwesterners how to cook lobsters, how to break open oysters, how to enjoy mussels, and particularly how to get every tiny infinitesimal little morsel out of a lobster in the proper <laughs> fashion. All my family, Rich and Ann, everybody that ever attended, we really enjoyed those parties, which went on for, for many, many years. This past Monday, two days ago, <clears throat> Gary and I had our annual date to make our master's golf predictions. Um, in one era, one of us would get Jack Nicklaus and the other would get Tom Watson. In the more current time, one would get Phil Mickelson, one would get Tiger. Um, but after we got the kind of the two big guys out of the, out of the way, then you know, our picks would sort of fall into our prejudices, prejudices and our preferences. Gary would normally take U.S. golfers. I would normally take <clears throat> foreign golfers. Uh, Gary, I, Gary, I knew Gary would never pick a player who he thought was a whiner or a complainer. <laughs> so I could always wait and get Colin McEnroe and Sergio Garcia <laughs> and a few others. And Gary knew that he could always wait if he wanted to pick Bubba Watson or Zach Johnson because he knew I would never pick a player who credited his victory to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, at the end, when we were pretty much done picking, Gary would always say, and I get all the Osakis. That, would, that meant that he got the players left over from countries that were prominent in World War II. <laughs> and I always, and I got all the players from South Africa and Zimbabwe because of all the years I lived in those two countries. <laughs> Starting tomorrow will be the first Masters in certainly more than 40 years in which I don't have on my television an old restaurant napkin or an old scorecard which has my picks and Gary's picks about the, um, about the Masters. Gary only failed me in one way with respect to golf. I suppose we've probably played pretty, between 750 and 1,000 rounds together in 45 years. And far more with one another than either of us played with everybody else combined. During those years, Gary had three holes in one, and I never saw one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody's perfect. <laughs> So that's my first category. My second category is write one page a day. Gary and I loved being professors. We both realized how fortunate we were to be in a job that we really loved and at a university and in a department we deeply cared for. Gary was a wonderful teacher and mentor, and the outpouring of tributes from the graduate students, many of whom are in this room today, over the decades has been astonishing, and I hope they've been gratifying to Carol. Gary's willingness to help graduate students write and complete their dissertations was really legendary. In addition, Gary, unlike many professors, was always willing to teach large courses. It occurred to me as I thought about Gary's teaching that with his career here of over 40 years, with his willingness always to teach large classes, with his very regular teaching of summer school and intercession courses and all the rest, 
I think it is likely, in fact, I, I, I'm sure I'm certain, that Gary Clifford probably, I would say certainly, taught more students at the University of Connecticut than any professor who has ever worked at this institution. I can't imagine it could not be true. We had many, many conversations about teaching, about writing, about research. We often wrestled with how to teach, how to teach students how to write well. And particularly, how to go about writing the first long paper they had to ever confront, like an honors thesis or a master's paper, a dissertation. And we always thought that the best thing to do was to disaggregate the process. I was very taken in the beautiful blog that Rekha Dada, who's here today, wrote about Gary, when she mentioned the idea of write one page a day. Because we always believed, and Gary certainly taught it to many students in this room, that instead of telling the student to write a chapter by the end of September or get half of it done by Christmas time, just write a page or maybe two pages a day. Because the tortoise is always going to beat the hare in getting a project done if it's steady, ongoing work on a daily basis. And uh, that's the way he taught and the tributes to him bear that out. <coughs> Gary never stopped writing. In this year alone, Gary is publishing three books. There was always one topic in which I was his faithful research assistant. For as long as I can remember, I always brought Gary articles about presidents and golf. And I always wanted him to write this as a popular book. We always had fantasies of being popular writers rather than academic writers. Three weeks ago, when Gary and Henry and George and I had our last lunch together, I brought a, a long article in that I just picked out on JFK and golf. And I said something to Gary, like, he's sitting right next to me, I said, Gary, you only had three books coming out this year. Isn't the Presidents in Golf book finally coming along? And he looked at me, he just broke out laughing, he said, nope, that one's going to have to be published posthumously. That's what he said to me. <laughs> Little did we know what was going to happen in the next week. My third category is Pennant Fever Sweeps Eastward. <laughs> One minute here. Probably some of you know, probably all of you know, is Gary was a fanatical Red Sox fan. Gary, with his marvelous memory, could tell you all the statistics and all the data about Ted Williams, Bill Lee, Carlton Fisk, Bill Buckner, Big Pappy, you name it. And he liked nothing better than tra trading jokes and jives with the Yankee fans. Once I learned this, every April for decades, when the Red Sox won their first game in April, I would send them a postcard, now of course an email, that the category was, Pennant Fever Sweeps Eastford. <laughs> and, and it was a long-standing joke of ours. But there's an unusual story about Gary in the World Series. During the year, Gary would watch the Red Sox game faithfully, keeping up on every detail. But in 1904, 2004, 2007, and last year, Gary watched not one minute of any of the series games. He simply was too nervous. He would never watch them. And we would tease him about this and on and on. But he simply stayed his course. He had his very own way of bringing the Red Sox to victory. My last category is, here's looking at you, Ken. Most of you know that Gary was a film buff as long as you limit the films to those made before 1950. <laughs> um, there could be no doubt that Casablanca was Gary's favorite film. I am sure that if put to the test, Gary could have recited the entire film script from memory. I always thought Casablanca was his favorite film and the, because he found in the dialogue many things that could be somewhat of a metaphor for his own life. Can there be any doubt when, when Rick says, here's looking at you, kid, that Gary was thinking, here's looking at you, Carol. And when Rick says, we'll always have Paris, can you not imagine Gary saying, we'll always have Athens, we'll always have Eastford? And, when, and after reading Carol's moving and heartbreaking story of their last words together, I love you, I love you too, I could only remember <coughs> Ilsa saying, kiss me, kiss me like it's the last time. And when Rick says, oh, he's just like any other man, only more so, certainly he was talking about Gary. There never will be a right, have been a right time or place for Gary to have died so young. But if it had to be, 
And if it was not in a sand trap, <laughs> then it is appropriate that it was next to a library. Gary's father died when he was a young teenager, and I've always thought that since then, libraries and archives were like a second home and a place of refuge for Gary. After Carol, his work was his passion. As sad as I am today, I am very glad that 45 years ago, I walked into Monteith and met Gary, little knowing then that I, what I know now is that it would be the start of a beautiful friendship. Thank you. Oh,